welcome to our Open Source Summit uh, EU. Uh, we, uh, or should I say, do we have to say Europe now instead of EU? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't, listen, America has a lot of problems too, okay? <laughs> uh, so, uh, welcome. How many people here is it, it's your first time at the event? Oh, wow, so quite a lot of, oh, excellent. Welcome, welcome, very, very good. How many here people are from France? Many of you from France here? All right, quite a few, quite a few. What a wonderful country. Uh, I got the uh, chance to sample some of your wines uh, yesterday. Very, very good. Uh, my daughter, actually, she's 11 years old and she goes to a French school in uh, the United States. And the reason we send her to the French school is because she's going to be my translator when we come here to enjoy your wine. So, it's very nice. We have an amazing event this week, three uh, great days planned for everyone. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a little bit of time to thank our sponsors, uh, in particular uh, Intel, uh, for uh, making this event possible. Uh, Intel has been a long-term uh, friend of the Linux Foundation and is a terrific sponsor. Uh, in addition to Intel, our platinum sponsors, uh, CNCF, Google, uh, IBM, ST, uh, all want to thank you for, couldn't be possible, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, I also want to thank our program chairs, uh, who did an amazing job putting together all the content. The hardest part about being a program chair is you have to turn down a lot of good talks. Uh, so what you're seeing uh, at this event is really the, the cream of the crop of, of an amazing set of talks. Uh, a few brief housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, the sponsor showcase is at uh, the forum level in forum four and five. So go check it out. We've got uh, great sponsors who are showing off all their uh, interesting tech and services today. Uh, there are also coffee breaks, which are located uh, there as well, and also plenty of meeting and hack space. So please take advantage of all of that. Uh, Wi-Fi is on the back of your conference schedule, so if you need the, the Wi-Fi, go ahead and check it out there. Uh, I also want to call out uh, that we have uh, a schedule on the go on Skedge.com, so if you want to get that, go ahead and download it, please. That would be great. Uh, in addition, I'd like to highlight our diversity and inclusion uh, initiative. Uh, so we have two uh, events tomorrow. There's a woman and open source lunch at 12.55. Uh, we, every uh, event we do, uh, we try and do something like this and we get great feedback. So if uh, you uh, would like, please go check it out. You have to pre-register though. Uh, and then we have a speed mentoring event at uh, 225 uh, tomorrow as well in St. Clair 3. So go check uh, all those things out. Uh, and then a uh, final reminder, we have a code of conduct. It's uh, prominently displayed all over. Uh, please adhere. We want to make this a friendly and welcoming uh, space to everyone. And uh, we, every year, kind of look at how this event grows and grows and grows, and I think what's interesting is how much this event grows with the growth of uh, open source. Uh, open source now has become sort of a fundamental building block for almost every uh, technology product and service. And uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, where the Linux Foundation, as a part of the open source movement, has been, and where the Linux Foundation is going. And uh, for anyone who's been around uh, the Linux Foundation for a while, uh, we very rarely talk about the Linux Foundation itself. We, I love talking about Linux, uh, we love talking about Kubernetes and Node.js and all of the wonderful projects at the foundation, but rarely do I kind of talk about what is the overall uh, Linux Foundation doing and what things are we seeing uh, on our radar. And I thought today I would spend a little bit uh, of time breaking uh, the first rule of the Linux Foundation, which is don't talk about the Linux Foundation. Uh, but before we do that, one of the things that I wanted to show you to sort of set uh, what I'm talking about is to think about how open source has not only transformed all of the tech industry, but is now moving beyond traditional technology companies and really is uh, the, the, the method of open source is being used in industries that you wouldn't have necessarily expected. 
And the, the first one I want to highlight is an effort we launched recently with the motion picture and film industry. And uh, when, when you see a movie today, uh, all of these movies uh, are created with uh, software and digital effects. Uh, and it's really amazing to see how uh, we were able to work with a whole new industry to show them how to use open source uh, to improve uh, the work that they were doing. Let's check out this video and see uh, how that's being done. Every single part of the filmmaking process is touched by software and a lot of that software is open source software. The Academy Software Foundation exists to provide a great home for open source projects that we as an industry use every day. Whether you are a user of open source software, or an engineer, or a company that relies on open source software, we want to create the right ecosystem for you to get the most out of the open source software that you need to use. Find us at aswf.io and join the mailing list and see how you can get involved. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So. The gentleman in that video is the chairman of the Academy Software Foundation. His name's Rob Brito. He's the president of Industrial Light and, Ma uh, Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, he was nominated for an Oscar this year for his work on the solo film. Uh, and it's just an amazing person. And in talking with him, what he has told me is we are looking for new people to come into our industry through this open source project. And you know, in California in particular, getting into the movie industry, particularly at that level, working on films like Star Wars and The Avengers, is really tough. And he has said, if you go in and start working on these projects, you know, open VDB, open EXR, that's your foot in the door, that they're actively looking to hire people. And I think it's an important statement from the president of a uh, major, major uh, part of the film industry to say, you know, code is the new resume, and, and we're really looking to recruit people from uh, the open source world. I also think what's fascinating about the Academy Software Foundation is that we're partnering with uh, the Oscars, uh, which is super cool. Uh, and, you know, name another open source project that has such a cool promotional video, right? Spider-Man, Star Wars, the Avengers. I mean, Linux, you know, all Linux has is uh, this penguin. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's cute. Uh, Although I should be fair, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has uh, Fippy and Friends, so equally good. Uh, and our I, I was sort of telling all of the different Linux Foundation projects, you know, be more like the Academy Software Foundation. They have these great promotional uh, videos and logos, and it's really compelling. And so our networking group also came up uh, with what they thought would be a good way to promote and explain their project. Here it is right there. <laughs> They're really, those networking people, I tell you. Uh, but certainly open source has become the, one of the most successful enablers of, of global in innovation in the world. Just the raw amount of code and innovation that's coming out of all of these projects every year continues to go uh, up and to the left. Uh, now we're just seeing it center around these huge ecosystems, whether it's the JavaScript ecosystem, embedded systems, uh, operating system software, the film industry, cloud computing. Uh, it's just uh, the automotive sector. I was just at a meeting last week for our auto uh, project, Automotive Grade Linux. It's, it's really everywhere. 
And, you know, the Linux Foundation has been a part of that, and I thought it would be interesting to look at where we've been and where we're headed, because uh, at the Foundation, our communities uh, are really pushing us to take that open source innovative model, innovation model, and move it beyond just software itself. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting for all of you to see what the future looks like for a lot of new and up and, co up and coming projects at the foundation. You know, we kind of all got our start uh, at the foundation with Linux, uh, providing a home for Linus Torvalds, uh, the legal and intellectual property support infrastructure around that, uh, events like this, uh, and soon we started working uh, adjacent to Linux on open source projects, whether it's embedded systems with Yocto, which Yocto, I think, I don't know where Kate Stewart is, is now the majority share of kind of an embedded build tool uh, for uh, any kind of custom Linux distribution. Uh, Keragrade Linux was an important effort to get uh, open source software into the telecommunications industry early on. Uh, but very soon, beyond just uh, things related to Linux, the foundation uh, began working on software plumbing uh, up the stack or down the stack in the case of, of uh, networking uh, and uh, many other things that started transforming uh, the way that software is impacting the, the telecommunications and networking sector. And about three to four years ago, things started to really explode where uh, we started working in the auto sector. Uh, our automotive grade Linux uh, initiative is in 20 million or more production vehicles uh, today from companies like Toyota and Daimler Chrysler and Hyundai and, and many others. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation, home to Kubernetes, has created the de facto uh, standard for how people create uh, deploy and manage their cloud computing infrastructure. Uh, the one Linux Foundation project you, you may not know of uh, is our Let's Encrypt project. Uh, how many people here know Let's Encrypt? So, all right, good, a lot of you. This is a good audience. Uh, it's the, the Linux Foundation and Let's Encrypt is the world's largest certificate authority. Uh, you know, what Let's Encrypt has really done is uh, created so many more uh, websites that HTTPS is the default for, and that has improved the privacy and security of all of our uh, lives. But beyond software, uh, about two years ago, we started really working on the concept of both software development and open standards development. You know, it's funny, the, the people in the open source community are often critical of standards bodies and so forth, but uh, both standards and software are actually critical for the adoption of much of the technology uh, that the industry and all of us require so that things work uh, properly together, whether that's through a de facto uh, standard uh, like Kubernetes or a, a de jure standard, you know, where something like OCI uh, or GraphQL, uh, these are really important. We started working through uh, efforts underneath the Linux Foundation umbrella, like the Joint Development Foundation, uh, GraphQL Foundation, uh, and OCI, to create standards in a rapid way that are compatible with the intellectual property frameworks uh, of open source. Uh, we think it's important that uh, if you're going to do standards development, that it be done in an open way and that it be compatible with the way that open source software gets developed. And so from Linux, to a broad array of open source software projects, to open standards, uh, that's been the path we've been charting. But this year, we've started to also enter into a couple of new areas. Uh, the first new area is around open hardware. Uh, more and more, what we're seeing are open hardware initiatives that uh, can help people uh, work on either specifications or actual implementations around some of the physical assets that are needed things like Open Power, uh, RISC-V, and our Chips Alliance. These are open hardware designs. And the idea here is we think this open model can accelerate uh, innovation in uh, a whole new way around uh, a field that's primarily been uh, done in a proprietary fashion. Uh, if you're not familiar with these projects, these are ones that you should watch. Uh, you know, just the RISC-V Foundation alone has hundreds of members uh, and is one of the fastest growing projects uh, at the Linux Foundation today. But it's not just open hardware where we're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, another area where we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth is in open data. 
And this is an area where I think in 2020, we're gonna start seeing uh, a huge amount of growth in data sharing uh, and in efforts to improve the state of open data as data becomes more critical to a lot of modern computing that's needed for machine learning applications and artificial intelligence, uh, we've started working on ways to make the sharing of that data easier. The first thing that we did was uh, worked on an open data license. So one of the things that we heard from everyone is, you know, even if I want to share my data, I have to go create an agreement with every single all the counterparty that I need to share that data with. And our thought was, hey, what if we could take the concepts around software and open source software licensing and apply those similar concepts to a data sharing agreement that everyone could agree upon, standardize on, just like uh, people have agreed upon a set of open source software licenses. Uh, and so we created a uh, community data license agreement uh, there are two of these agreements. One is a copyleft style license, sort of that share and share alike uh, that you see in uh, GPL licenses and uh, the EPL license uh, in the software side of the world. And then a more permissive license, uh, more of an Apache style uh, or MIT style license. So you can choose whether you want to require a share back for that data or whether you don't require that. But uh, both of these licenses are available uh, on the Linux Foundation website and were created in conjunction with, uh, I think, over 50, where's our attorney, Mike? How many? 50 attorneys from the major Linux Foundation member companies who, you know, are the ones who are actually creating these data sharing agreements themselves and uh, you know, came to consensus on these particular models. So I think that's one that's really interested uh, in, uh, in checking out. Uh, we're also working on best practices around how to actually do uh, data sharing. So we have uh, a project called datapractices.org. It's another one that I think is worth checking out. Uh, to show how you can structure data, open it up, uh, you know, create APIs, you know, make those smooth in terms of the uh, IP agreements that govern them as well. Uh, and we've seen a huge amount of interest uh, in organizations who are taking advantage of those best practices around uh, both open data sharing uh, and the practices themselves. Uh, we're also starting to see vertical industries participate in data sharing, which I think is incredibly interesting. This is largely being driven by both the en energy sector and the telecommunications sector. So the Linux Foundation Energy Initiative, uh, which has a lot of uh, participants actually here in France, uh, are working to share uh, data that you know isn't necessarily proprietary data, but if everyone, every grid operator or every uh, energy provider shared this data, uh, they could use it to create a more efficient uh, energy grid management uh, system, and that would obviously improve uh, all of the uh, output around climate change and things that are directly impacted uh, by the energy sector. In the telecommunications industry, we're seeing this exact same thing play out where network operators globally are sharing big data sets uh, in order to improve cell phone tower maintenance, as an example, or uh, exchanging data uh, around certain telemetry in order to improve cybersecurity uh, for uh, their networks. So open data and open hardware are the two things that, as you look at where the industry, where the communities are starting to head, these are these are two big areas that you should really keep your eye on. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be less uh, open source projects, uh, but these are areas where uh, we're really seeing a lot of excitement uh, and energy uh, around it. So this is really where the foundation is heading, from major open source software initiatives to uh, standardization if, uh, initiatives in an open way uh, to uh, open hardware to open data. That's really been the path, and that's what you'll see in subsequent months that the uh, Linux Foundation supports. Uh, and today, to that end, uh, I would like to welcome some new uh, people and projects uh, at the uh, Foundation. Uh, we seem to be adding a new project at least once a week, and many times uh, several a week. Uh, so it's been a, a crazy year at the Foundation. 
Uh, but today we have some special announcements, uh, and I'm excited to have some people uh, join me here. So I'd like to uh, kind of give you the high-level framework, and then we'll start having some of these people come out. So we have a new Linux Foundation family member that I'm going to be announcing here uh, quickly. Uh, some new legal initiatives that are, are important to help make sure that all of you can have confidence in the open source software uh, that you're implementing. Uh, and then a new project to improve the Linux kernel. Uh, we've got Greg Crow Hartman here uh, from the kernel project uh, who will tell us about how they're doing that. So uh, the first person that I would like to introduce is a, the newest member of the Linux Foundation uh, family. Uh, Robin Jin comes to us as the new executive director of the OpenJS Foundation. How many people know the OpenJS Foundation here? Not all of you. How many people here know Node.js? All right, we get a round of applause here. Right? So Node.js, uh, the uh, J o Node JS Foundation and the JS Foundation merged uh, earlier this year into the OpenJS Foundation. This is sort of uh, the center of a lot of uh, work in the JavaScript community. Uh, and uh, we were lucky enough to get Robin to come uh, from a more than 10-year run at Microsoft uh, where she led a lot of the early initiatives at Microsoft around open source software. Uh, she's agreed to come and become the new executive director of the OpenJS Foundation. We are delighted to have her. Uh, please welcome to the stage the executive director of the OpenJS Foundation, Robin Jin.